You are watching Grassroots Community Television, helping you make television people watch everywhere. Broadcasting on cable channel 82 in Glenwood Springs and Carbondale, and channel 12 in Aspen, Snowmass, Basalt, and Elder Belt. Pre over the air broadcasts throughout the Roaring Fork Valley. All programs can be watched anytime, anywhere at grassrootstv.org. We've gone from the real high level of ideas and uh, examples around local vesting, and try, this panel is about trying to see about how it might work in our region. Uh, so we have a panel uh, discussion that Amy will help moderate. Uh, each of the panelists will give brief overviews of their what they're doing in the world of uh, investment. Uh, we're fortunate enough to have McCabe Callahan um, and Blue oh, oh, uh, from Community Funded, which is not from our region, but it's in the state, uh, from Fort Collins. And there was a lot of discussion earlier this morning about local vesting and how are these groups formed and are they for-profit or non-profit? Well, these guys are doing it right now in the state and they're gonna answer some of those questions. Um, we also have Steve Beckley with the Columbia uh, Adventure Park. He's going to share the uh, profit, the for-profit uh, business perspective around uh, providing financing and capital for his his efforts here in Glenwood Springs. Uh, Michael McBoy with the Manaus Fund, which is a non-profit entity that provides seed capital to non-profits so they can grow and innovate and do good works. And uh, Randy Lowenthal with the Royal Fork uh, uh, business, business Resource, Resource Center. Center. He's there. He's there. <laughs> it's after lunch. Um, is going to talk about her efforts and also remind us about um, what we might want to do um, after this event in terms of moving this whole idea forward. And then, of course, Amy's going to ask questions of her own. And hopefully, this is very interactive, back and forth in terms of uh, it's very informal. Uh, so, if you have questions, we'll try and get to as many as we can and uh, we'll go through, we'll adapt on the fly. So this mic will probably get moved around quite a bit. Um, and so with that, we're gonna start with McCabe, who's gonna give an overview of uh, community funding. Thank you, Colin. Hello, everyone, and uh, thank you for having me here today. Colin, thank you for the invitation. Just a whole bit of Yeah, sure. Uh, thanks for the invitation to come speak to you guys. Uh, my partner, yeah. Blue Hobatter, and I have come all the way from Fort Collins, Colorado, which I assure you is a far away, as we spend most of our time on our bikes in beautiful Old Town, Fort Collins. Uh, coming all the way to Glenwood Springs was definitely a drive this morning, but uh, worthwhile to share this idea with you. Um, we have created a website that we call communityfunded.com. Um, and communityfunded.com is basically a crowdfunding platform and much more. But before I dive into what much more it is, I, I would like to just speak to you a little bit about crowdfunding in general. So crowdfunding as a concept is relatively new. Uh, many people don't know about crowdfunding. A study was done that said about 5% of people actually know what crowdfunding is, and even less than that have used it. Uh, crowdfunding has taken many shapes over the years. Uh, a couple examples I like to give is uh, President Obama using crowdfunding in the sense of taking lots of small donations for his, uh, when he's running for president for the first time to aggregate a total amount of money for his campaign. Uh, another example is past Blue Ribbon, uh, who raised over $200 million to try to buy the brewery, uh, even though that was before the SEC regulations and they're actually breaking some laws, but it's another example of it. Uh, and I also like to call taxes forced crowdfunding because essentially that's what it is. It's a lot of people giving little bits of money to help aggregate to a total. Um, Kickstarter.com is a website that launched uh, about four years ago and they really have put crowdfunding in the spotlight. Uh, if you guys have heard of Kickstarter, it's a crowdfunding website that focuses on creative arts and it focuses on only creative art projects. Uh, they really have done a great job at getting their name out there, getting lots of projects. They funded over $270 million in funding, uh, passing the National Endowment for the Arts from the federal government this year. So uh, it's 
something that is proven and working. Uh, when Blue and I actually sat down and got the idea for Community Funded, uh, we basically were inspired by Kickstarter. We heard an NPR story about this great new website helping fund creative artists, and our two questions were, what about a local community-based model, and what about a model that can fund anything, not just the creative arts? So when we set out to build a Community Funded, we had some other ideas in mind. It wasn't just about the one-directional crowdfunding that takes place in today's websites. It was more about the idea of collaboration. Now that's a word that since I've been here this morning, I've heard thrown around many different times. I think that's why a lot of you guys are here, is because collaboration is the way of the future. We all know that. We know it's the way that things are gonna start happening and it's gonna start changing the way things occur in this world. Right now, currently registered on Facebook, there's more registered users than there existed on the entire planet 100 years ago. And that's important because I don't think we've realized the power of what that means. I think that to me, what that tells me is that it's more people that can come together and focus on a common cause and share resources and ideas to do great things. That's essentially what we've done with Community Funded. What I wanna do real quick, uh, and I just asked Colin for a couple minutes here because before I answer questions, I wanted you guys to see exactly what we're doing. Uh, this is the homepage of Community Funded here. And even though crowdfunding is a mechanism that we're using on the site, uh, what we're trying to inspire is what we're calling mega community collaboration. What that means to me is basically groups and organizations and people coming together to focus their resources, time, energy, funds on one concept to make it a reality. On this homepage, you'll see here these are different project cards with how many days left, the amount of money they've been pledged to or donated, uh, as well as the percentage of funding that they've raised so far. Um, on this homepage, you can see the projects we have currently. For the last two months, we've funded over 16 projects, $150,000, and we've really made our focus to build a model that works in our region, in Fort Collins, Northern Colorado area, and then with the desire to come to communities like this and share this idea with other people so that they can be inspired as well. Our slogan is anything is possible when it's community funded. And that's true in the sense that it's really limited by your creativity. We've created a tool here that allows anyone to come up with any idea and unite a community around the idea. Uh, what this map here that Blue is showing you is an example of uh, it's all the, uh, one place mark for every zip code of a registered user on Community Funded. What's cool to me about this is the fact that even though we're Fort Collins based, you can see that there's been support from around the entire United States around ideas in Fort Collins. Uh, we had our first out of state project that unfortunately I had to pull the project, but it's exciting to see a project in North Carolina that was trying to raise money to reopen a uh, bookshop and cafe. So, uh, so even though we are focused in Fort Collins right now, uh, anyone at any time can use this site and use this tool. So we're gonna jump over from the homepage to the Explore page. And the Explore page is basically a strong search engine for our site. Uh, what it allows you to do is really find the different projects, the different categories uh, of projects that we have available. Each category has subcategories that you know, we put out there to basically seed ideas for people. Even though not all categories have projects in them, you can see that you know, the idea is if someone sees a category, they might have a project or idea that can fit in there. Um, on the very top, you'll see what really makes us unique to all crowdfunding sites right now is that we have created a tool that allows us to fund standard projects, which are for-profit companies, nonprofits, as well as charitable causes. And that really makes us unique because in the crowdfunding world right now, uh, sites really have a focus, creative arts, nonprofits, small business, but not one is doing all of them in one. And so the idea of mega community collaboration, we want to see cross collaboration between nonprofits and for profits. Uh, if you pull down the map here on the Explore page, you'll see that uh, it shows the actual project locations. And again, very Fort Collins centric. We have uh, a project that just launched outside of Fort Collins. Uh, you know, really the idea here is as we get more and more projects online, you'll see dots of community funded all around the United States of communities that are embracing this tool and using it for good things. On the very top of the Explore page, I just wanna point out a couple last features here. Uh, we have, you can sort between the community, which you have the projects we're searching now. The community is basically all the registered members of organizations and individuals. We intend to really make this more robust and useful for finding organizations to support your community because they're involved in this website. Uh, and then the last tab is gift backs. Another big distinguishing factor between us and uh, other crowdfunding sites is that we're trying to take a con consumer approach to crowdfunding. What we've created is the ability to literally shop for items. You can buy gift cards and advertising and artwork and events and different things you can search for. And then the ability to click on the gift back and see what project that 
gift back is going to support. The gift backs are the items you get back in exchange for what you're pledging to a project. So within this model, we've also created the ability for organizations or individuals to make what's called a community offering. This is basically uh, digital, digitalizing in-kind donations. So a business can come on and say, I want to give to this project, but I want to give you money. I'm going to give them some of my products. And so they give a gift card or a t-shirt or whatever they want to give, and people can pledge for those items. The business delivers the gift back and hopefully earns a new customer, while the project gets the money and the person who's pledging gets the item. So it's a, it's a beautiful model for uh, supporting great ideas. This is a project page, and this is how, where our wrap up. Uh, the project page basically features uh, the project that you, that the application, uh, that project creator creates with the application. You have a video to very much personalize the experience and you can see who exactly is doing the project. Description. Up in the top right you see project heroes. Uh, those are people that have pledged more than $500 or offered community offerings. We have a matching system built in where here you can see New Belgium has done a $2,500 match to this project. We make it easy for a donation to not have to get a gift back. You can just pledge money right to a project. Uh, or you can select what gift backs you want. So in this project page, you know, everyone's project page looks the same, but people will offer different gift backs and obviously have different descriptions and videos. Um, at the very top here, if you click on the supporters map, or the supporters tab here, then you'll see that we build in a supporters map that shows where the support's coming for each project. So you know, it's really it's been a fun experience. We're all CSU graduates from Fort Collins. We are entrepreneurs. We started businesses in Fort Collins. And this is really a labor of love. We love our community and we love the idea of collaboration. And so we created a tool to hopefully accomplish that. So thank you very much. In, in the interest of time, why don't we go through the panel real quickly and then we'll get to the questions. Is it okay if I stay seated? So uh, my name is Steve Beckley. I'm the owner of Glenwood Caverns Adventure Park. And uh, Randy asked me to talk just to some of the, the real life scenarios of how we had to raise money, especially when uh, the banks quit lending money about four years ago. So uh, financing dried up. So we still had a growth period. We we're still growing. Uh, our cash flow was increasing, uh, but I didn't have any way to put any new attractions in. So. What we did was we went out and uh, started a, a new corporation and uh, raised money and bought the equipment. It's a leasing company, Iron Mountain Leasing. So that company bought the equipment with local investors and then Glenwood Caverns actually leased the equipment back from the, that company. And uh, uh, so we got our equipment. The investors got about a 9% rate of return, and plus I got all the depreciation on the equipment, so it was really a, a tax-free type thing. And then at the end of the lease period of five years, uh, we have a, a buyback and, and it's done. So what we did, is we and this tool we used uh, to, to uh, buy about $800,000 worth of equipment, new rides and stuff. So um, it was a win-win for everybody. You know, I couldn't get financing, and uh, the locals got a good rate of return, and we got equipment in, and, and since we put that in, our, our attendance has increased from about 120,000 visitors a year to 165,000 a year. So this, this equipment really helped us go over the top as far as uh, the number of people and, and our business model. So you know, if you don't have financing, as you know, you can't get a lot of stuff done. Everything takes money. So this is a, it was a great uh, way to get locals invested into the cap. So. I'll stand up. And I'm almost tempted to just talk because I have a loud voice, but I'll try and keep this in front of me. Uh, if you can't hear me, let me know. I'm with the Manaus Fund, which is a nonprofit fund that was established about six years ago at this point. We have several million dollars in assets of various kinds, and our goal is to invest those assets in particular in the nonprofit world and try and bring an entrepreneurial uh, spirit and discipline to the nonprofit world and to also create public private partnerships uh, in the valley where the private sector hasn't otherwise been able to accomplish some of the of the missions that that communities often have uh, probably the most prominent project that we've been involved with in the last four or five years is the third street center in carbondale which was essentially a partnership between 
Manaus, uh, the town of Carbondale that, old, that owned the old elementary school when it had reached an agreement with the school district to take over the old building, and with Alpine Bank. Uh, and those three entities came together with an objective of converting the old elementary school, uh, 45,000 square foot building, remodeling it, making it much more energy efficient, and turning it into a nonprofit center. Uh, Manaus had a half million dollar investment in that, and we considered that to be an investment. It was essentially a loan. And we started in 2008, uh, raised a total of four and a half million dollars, two million in grants, and two and a half million, a little over that, in construction money with Alpine Bank, and then put together a conduit bond, which is a tax exempt bond approved by the town of Carbondale that was used to take out the construction financing. And the entire construction financing was set up as a, uh, it was released as we leased up the space. Starting in 2008, we raised the full four and a half million dollars and the building is now 100% leased with a waiting list to get in. Uh, rental rates are under $10 a foot base, uh, a little bit more with triple net, but it was a true success for the public and the private sector, and, and I think anybody who's aware of that project would consider it to be one of the best things that's happened to Carbondale, certainly in the last five years. Um, we put our half million dollars in, we got our half million dollars off out, and then we went up to Basalt, and we're currently involved in, we purchased the Pan and Fork Trailer Park in Basalt, about a year ago, and we have our investment in that. We have borrowed money to, for the purchase of the property. We did it in partnership with the town of Basalt. Uh, the town put a million two into purchase of the property, and they're going to convert about three acres of the land into a riverside park. Uh, the Community Development Corporation, which is the nonprofit entity that is actually working with this and is funded through Manaus. Uh, is developing a uh, essentially a 2.3 acre development which we anticipate will have a hotel and mixed use uh, kind of uh, project in the middle of downtown Basalt. We will also be, and this is one of the main reasons we got involved in the project, we'll be relocating 38 families who currently live in the trailer park. They're living in the floodplain. They have to be moved and we will be also putting together a project for replacement housing for those people, uh, and at the same time being essentially a major uh, economic development uh, project for the middle of downtown Basalt, uh, especially with a hotel and bringing a lot of traffic to the town. We've also done another major project in, in Garfield County um, by lending money to lift up, we helped them buy their thrift store in Rifle by a loan they paid us back. And then we sat down and worked out a deal with them where we went down and bought the building in Parachute where their thrift store is. And that's a thrift store that funds the food bank. So again, it's, uh, it's got a sort of double, what we refer to as a double bottom line. We like to have the social benefit that comes out of the nature of our projects and the financial return. And we refer to that as a double bottom line because we're not in the business of giving away our money, we're in, a, in the business of trying to invest it and make it a, a successful return in the nonprofit world so we don't have to keep going out and raising capital. Um, there was one other thing I just wanted to throw out, this is a little tangential, but I understand from the discussions this morning, um, I sit on the retirement boards of both Pitkin County and RAFTA between those two boards, we manage close to $50 million worth of retirement funds. And one of the classic things as the discussion comes around to how to put together pools of money, um, I think it was, what was it, Willie Sutton, who back in the 1930s was a bank robber, and when asked why he robbed banks, made the comment, well, that's because that's where the money is. <laughs> and um, one of the things that I think is a potential is to think in terms of where are pools of money that might be able to be tapped. $50 million worth of retirement funds, if you even got 5% of those funds put together and put into a fund that would be available to community if the participants and beneficiaries of the retirement plans were willing to make that contribution or that investment, 
um, you would have a two and a half million dollar fund that could invest locally, the retirement beneficiaries could get a return on their investment and it would be a great pool that could be available to a community or to you know, various uh, projects. And it could be a pretty democratic process with, with people on a board helping to choose what kind of projects got that kind of investment. So um, it's just one of the thoughts that I've had that might be appropriate. I know there are a couple of officials from those counties and entities, so I hope I didn't surprise you. Yeah. I'm probably going to try and propose that. <laughs> oh, I don't think I can. Randy Lowenthal, we're in Fork Business Resource Center. If I had it to do over again, I would have picked another name. It's too complicated. Um, we cranked up in 2009. In our original business plan, we thought uh, that probably 50% of our clients would be startups and 50% would be established businesses. And it's turned out to be probably 85% startups. Um, and a lot of what we are doing from technical assistance perspective is business plans and cash flow projections. And why are we doing it? Because of the subjects for today. It's because of access to capital. Those startups looking for funds uh, it's Amy's term of helping them become investment ready. Uh, I can't tell you how many times when we've sat down with prospective clients who said to us, what do you mean cash flow projections? I don't even go into balance sheets and profit and loss. Let's just talk about the cash. If you don't have it, you can't spend it. Oh, that's a good idea. Um, so. We do a lot of technical assistance, but one of the things that we also uh, talked about in the very beginning was something like helping create alternatives in the region. That uh, we had already in 2009 seen that the lending had practically stopped, that commercial alternatives uh, were getting more difficult all the time. When we first cranked up, we went to the banks and we have several sponsors, Alpine Bank, American National Bank, hopefully soon First Bank. Hi, Tom. <laughs> um, and um, we said to them, so if you have somebody coming, walking in with this great napkin full of ideas script with numbers scribbled on it, what do you tell them? And they said, well, gee, we really don't have a resource. So we said, that's what we wanted. That's one of the things we want to do, send them to us. We'll try to help work them through it talk about the big picture strategy, talk about uh, what they think they can or cannot do, and let's put numbers to it to see if it's really possible or not. The access to capital on our website, which is rfbrc.org, um, there is an access to capital page and access to capital resources. We list things uh, that are other than the commercial banks, like Axion that was referred to this morning, uh, Colorado Lending Source, thank you. They're a big sponsor of the center. Um, uh, Chaffa for the state of Colorado, the state of Colorado itself and other funds. So what we try to do in our travels is find other alternatives so that it's not just the commercial banks. It's anywhere where we think funding can happen. We are currently the administrator of the Town of Carbondale Revolving Loan Fund. They've set aside uh, $100,000 for small businesses that are within the town limits of Carbondale, and we applied for and received a grant from USDA to add another $50,000 to that fund. Um, I'm looking at Julie from the Rifle Economic Development, Rifle Area Economic Development Corporation. Um, we've suggested more than once to Garfield County that we think, for example, to Garfield, and I see Rachel, and I'd love to talk to Pitkin about it too, that we think that would be a great idea for the counties, that instead of each municipality trying to garner funds for a small business loan fund, why not do it at the county level? So um, again, whatever kinds of alternatives we can think about, uh, we love this local vesting idea, we love some of the things that we found in Amy's book, and we hope to pursue it and see if we can get some interest um, from one end to the other. We really do believe in regional and collaborative which obviously has already been talked about. So um, uh, we hope to see if there's enough interest. And I was thrilled when Colin called and said, that's what we're going to be doing. And I said, wow, maybe we can really finally launch this thing. Um, so thank you, everybody. And that was a great, uh, this is a great lineup we have. 
Um, so, why don't we start by, um, can we each, can, can we go starting with Randy and um, going through the panel, and can you um, talk a little bit about what your biggest challenges have been in terms of either um, getting capital or in finding, um, you know, good projects uh, to put, for example, on your crowdfunding website or um, investment ready companies. Like, what are the real challenges? And then I'm hoping that we can segue into solutions and um, what, uh, what models might work for some of your different areas and the greater um, uh, region in general. Um, one of our biggest problems has been uh, just the network. Uh, we have individuals coming to us for business from, uh, that are business owners or about to be business owners saying, I went to the bank, uh, I'm not going to be able to do this. Uh, what other alternatives do you know about and how can you do it? And we have not had a great answer to that. We've been a little bit creative and we've been able to put a few people together, but not a whole lot. We've also had a few investors come to us who said, you know, I'm looking for this, and if you find someone who does, keep it under your hat, but if you could put us together, that would be terrific. So this for us, and that's why I say if there's a way to, to actually launch this as a vehicle and be able to call it whatever you want, be the facilitator to help make this happen, um, we're very excited about it. So probably one of the, the biggest uh, problems we have is uh, is the uniqueness of our business. Uh, most banks, we don't fit inside the box, so uh, conventional loans have really dried up for that. So that's why we've had to think out of the box and look for other sources. So, you know, as your business expands and you can't get funds, it, it makes it very difficult. So that's been the biggest thing is just trying to convince people that we're not, we're, we are a good risk and, and uh, uh, it will work, so. I'm curious, are the banks coming to you now that you're successful? Uh, you know, uh, what was frankly, the question? The, the question was, is are the banks coming to us now because we're successful? And I would say, uh, no. Uh, <laughs> you know, we've, we've really been successful to some magnitude all the way from the beginning. You know, we've had constant growth, 11, 12 percent growth a year since we started and uh, showed great cash flow, but it's just the uniqueness. You know, what do you do with a cave and a tram if it goes bankrupt? So uh, that's, the, that's the biggest pullback for, for banks. So. Working in the nonprofit world in particular, I think one of the biggest challenges that we run across is bringing an entrepreneurial understanding and discipline and spirit to a nonprofit. Uh, one of our experiences has been that a lot of times, even entrepreneurs who work with nonprofits, they walk in the nonprofit door and they somehow leave the entrepreneurial part of them outside that door and they go from knowing about earning money and getting a return on investment to getting trained into how do you ask people for money. And we have found over the years that if there's one thing that most nonprofits really don't like to do, it's ask for money. And sometimes they're not very good at it. And so what we have learned to do is not only try and um, make associations relative to the entrepreneurial world and how, in many cases, members of an organization have been very successful in an entrepreneurial sense in another context, and get them to apply it to the, to the nonprofit, uh, we also have two specific things that we use as part of our process. The first is we give planning grants, uh, and that's essentially a grant to go out and put together a business plan and go through the discipline of understanding what a business plan looks like, what it takes to put the information in a format that will actually start to attract interest and support, and go through that whole process of actually understanding what it's going to take on a you know, on a competitive le level, essentially, um, to get the money and to go forward. The second thing that we've learned is one of the biggest things I think that stands in the way of almost any of these kinds of ideas is essentially the perception of risk. Uh, and I think in no small part what happened in 2008 was that we went from a society that as a whole 
um, didn't perceive much risk in the financial world to a society that all of a sudden had been completely slammed upside the head with what the consequences of risk are when they come home, and a lot of people experience that in their real estate values, in their house, or whatever it is, and all of a sudden we've become risk averse as a, as a culture. And I think it's what part of what we're hearing about when the banks are reluctant to lend, it's, it's the change in the risk standards that had gotten too lenient and allowed the bubble to burst, um, and now the over-adjustment to, to risk averse. Um, Manaus prides itself on being risk tolerant. And what we have found is that if you make a commitment to what you are working with, and if it doesn't start working out, instead of saying, uh-oh, we gotta go, close down, everybody's gone, you actually come in with more money, more training, and more commitment. That's how you get to success. The, the numbers on how many small businesses that start, uh, that are successful after three years are gruesome. On, on the order of 90% of small businesses fail within the first three years. But if you look at a process of being committed to that and working it through and providing additional capital, which is the main reason most small businesses don't make it, is lack of capital, um, and you go into it with a determination and commitment to make it work, um, a lot of those essentially failure stories would turn into success stories. And that's, that's our experience, and that's the way that we try and run our organization to make sure that we're more successful in, than just putting a couple of loans or investments out there and then watching them fail and saying, oh, well, now what do we do? We don't like to lose our money. We like to keep our money because we don't like raising it either. So, um, so that's, I think, what we would say. Well, just a couple different stories. Uh, first of all, my full-time job is I have coffee shops in Fort Collins. I opened two coffee shops. Um, I have two coffee shops now. I opened my first one when I was 22, still going to school at CSU. And as you can imagine, uh, I'm sure many of you heard the story, uh, oh, you don't have any money? Then we can't lend you any, sorry. And that's really what you hear from a lot of different people is if you don't have money already, then you're not gonna lend you any money. And so my coffee shops have basically been you know, credit card or sweat equity funded since the beginning of the last decade. And uh, even to the point of being in business for 10 years, uh, I had opened five shops and a bar over the course of four, my first four years, uh, learned some hard lessons and uh, pretty much paid the price of business school, learning the real way. And I uh, reconfigured my business, um, focused on the one shop that I kept open, uh, opened up one more shop, and in the process of trying to do that, uh, I had been open for 10 years, great credit score, I owned two houses, one rental property, and the banks weren't gonna lend me money. And so it ended up turning into a couple customers that heard that story that actually stepped up and, uh, and offered me the money to expand my shop to open a second shop across from CSU. Uh, and that really you know, was the start of community funding, to be honest with you, was to see someone in the community step up and offer that resource to me, because they believed in me and they believed in my idea. Uh, with community funded, we surprisingly have done this with absolutely nothing. We have no investment so far. We put uh, only money that we've raised between ourselves together to get what we work, to get where, to where we have been right now. Uh, we will be raising some money to, uh, to scale this to the next level. Uh, however, you know, really what we're trying to do is do this on a, on a very low budget way to show everyone that we can do this without needing big venture capitalists and, and uh, large dollar amounts to do something great. Uh, in, in the community funded model though, I'll just share that, uh, that crowdfunding uh, basically um, spreads the risk. It gets the risk onto a lot of people's shoulders so that if there is uh, a failure, then not one person necessarily had to share that, has had to take that on. But also, the more important thing is that crowdfunding in the sense that it exists now with other sites like Kickstarter and stuff like that, it's very one directional. You give the money and the project's over. In this idea of mega community collaboration, you have the resources available to you to talk to people that have done this before, share insights, get feedback, build ideas as you're raising the funds for your project because you have a lot of people contributing ideas to one thing, so. Uh, great, well, I, I love the model that you're following. Um, so clearly it seems like we need alternatives, right? Um, to uh, standard uh, traditional financing options out there. And um, this morning we've been talking about a lot of different um, alternatives from Lions to community loan funds to crowdfunding, uh, direct public offerings, uh, cooperatives, um, and various ways that these can work together or we can create public-private partnerships. 
So um, I kind of want to open up the discussion now to alternatives. Um, and also to Michael's point, um, where are the pools of money that exist? And I love that you brought up the pension funds because, you know, it's crazy that these, you know, it's, it's our retirement money. Well, I don't have a pension, but, um, you know, like say a CalPERS in California, and they're in fact the first pension fund that started putting a teeny bit of money, um, of their investment money to work locally. And it just makes good sense to diversify and to also provide benefits to the people who, you know, are, uh, are the pensioners. Um, so I'm going to pass the mic around again and um, maybe, you know, you can all share your sort of dream scenario or um, ideas for what might work um, in this region um, in terms of creating some of the alternatives that we're talking about. You use the word dream, right? Uh, uh, we, you know, community funded, we've just poured our hearts into this idea of collaboration and people coming together. Uh, you know, it's really about the numbers. You know, if you look at you know, 10,000 people offering $100, that's a million dollars in money that can be put towards a project. Uh, you know, really what it comes down to is uh, sharing ideas and people that are willing to offer up a little bit of their resources, and especially when you involve the organizations that can register accounts as well. Um, you know, everyone kind of collaborating to make ideas turn into reality. And, you know, I think that um, as dreamy as that sounds, it really empowers us because it allows communities to come together and do things that they want to accomplish without having to search and go the hard route road because, you know, the, the money's out there. It's just the idea that's needed. And uh, I think that with social media and the ability to share ideas rapidly and like the supporter maps show, you know, you can have an idea in the community and there'll be people all around the United States that will be willing to help that idea. And so that's, that's my dream. I'm, I'm not exactly sure what my dream would be, but I can see what the result would be, which would be, I think in many cases, in, in, in my for-profit world, and personally, I'm in the investment business, and one of the things I've learned over the last five years in particular in the investment business is that a lot of people who are investing have a sense of detachment or lack of understanding of the standard investment vehicles that are out there. I mean, there's the stock market, the bond market, there are also real estate, there are a lot of things that people are familiar with, but it's very difficult for most people to find a mechanism that actually allows them to, to participate in, in the things that they truly believe in. And socially conscious investment has been a rising phenomena. I think every time we put money into uh, a check and send it off to whatever governmental entity might be the receptor of that money, we start to say, boy, I really wish I could determine how my money were being used. Um, I guess a dream, and this is way off base, but there's a part of me that thinks that we ought to be able to vote where our property tax revenues go and force the governments to, to work in the direction that we want them to go rather than leave it in the hands of some of the political entities that don't always seem to, to, to do what a lot of us would have chosen. Um, and, and that's probably true on a lot of levels. But to me, the, the dream would be a mechanism that would really give people a sense that if they contributed to a situation, to a fund, to a pool of capital, whatever it was, that the money would be getting used in a fashion that they would actually uh, support, believe in, and feel like it was, you know, their money was doing some good instead of just going off and contributing to the big, the big boy that I think is out there for a lot of us. So that sense of local ownership, I think, is is absolutely essential. And if we could create an entity that would really give people the ability to be involved and be responsible and give them a return on in their investment, I think it could be very popular. Uh, this is a little bit more difficult for me. I guess dreaming for me is a, is a different different aspect, I guess. You know, first of all, I would like easier access to capital for expansion, but, you know, the dream is really, for me, is to make people smile, make family memories, you know, have a community that's proud of what, what we're doing, and, uh, I mean, that's really the dream for me, so. You can see me pulling this off. 
Um, another one of, uh, part of our mission statement, if you want to call it that, the vision actually, was to grow it locally. Um, people talk to us about economic development and business development. There's some line there. Um, we believe we're doing business development from the bottom up, which touches on economic development instead of doing it the other way around. And when we talk about our business development, uh, we talk about helping local businesses. And us, for us, the dream would be to actually have a way to do that. And to have, uh, as we've talked about, the vehicles that um, can, uh, the commercial banks are one thing, but to have some other options for people who aren't gonna be able to, to qualify for those types of lending situations. So, so this for us is, is part of that dream. And I think the other piece of it too it's really the ultimate give back. I think it's a lot of what Michael said and what others have said, which is this really allows people to support locally instead of wherever that is in the sky that we either all have historically invested or, or thought about. So I think it's, it's both parts for me. I just wanted to make a follow-up comment. Uh, you know, I'm excited to tell you, Michael, that the mechanism is here because uh, you know what we're really trying to encourage with, for example, the city of Fort Collins. We've been working a lot with, and um, you know, they, they after three months of meetings and talking to them, they've registered an account on community funded, and they've started actually funding projects through our website, uh, and that's exciting because it's another step forward in this model that we continue to push to our community, which is you know organizations like the city of Fort Collins having the ability to uh, obviously showcase projects on the website to say, you know, what community, what do you want to see in your community? And be able to show all the different things that they want to develop, and whether that's bike trails or parks or a community pool or whatever it might be, people are able to, you know, vote with their dollars. We use the word democratizing the dollar a lot with community funding because it allows people to give directly to what they want to give and be able to contact the people that are doing it and have discourse with them and, and really build that relationship and build community. So. Okay, so I think I've got it figured out. Um, Manaus will be another partner funding, community funded, and uh, Randy's group will help uh, you know, make sure that the, the, the projects coming on are investment ready and, and up to snuff, and then you can all fund Steve. There we go. Um, so I'd like to open it up to questions and um, suggestions and make this more interactive so does you know if people have ideas or, or questions um do you want to come up and use the mic no, or do you want to no, okay, I'll repeat. Like what happens when I give money? Do do I see any return on that money? Am I loaning money? Sure. Is this so, a charity? So I think we're speaking to it. So the question is, what what um, what model are we using in the sense of if I give money to an organization, is it an investment? Am I giving the money up? Is it a donation? Uh, and so a couple things about that. I'm, I'm sure you guys are aware of the Jobs Act and the crowdfunding, um, or the job yeah the Jobs Act and the crowdfunding bill that passed in April, uh, allowing for companies to use crowdfunding platforms for raising equity financing, uh, and. Uh, we've been obviously paying very close attention to this. It's a very interesting subject because what we're already starting to see is two things. One, a whole bunch of people trying to fit through one door, and that's always a challenge. Uh, but two, uh, the SEC continues to kind of drag their feet on releasing regulation and policy on how this is going to work. And so we're kind of waiting in the, in the wings to hear what uh, is going to come out of this because what it's already looking like is it's going to be still a very expensive process. You know, even if you're doing crowdfunding with uh, certain regulations that make it allowed right now in the state of Colorado, uh, or eventually the federal side of things, uh, you know, it's still a very expensive process, you know, up to upwards of $30,000 just to be able to get your project to start raising equity. Um, and so right now, our current model, because it isn't allowed to do, you know, you can't do crowdfunding for equity uh, on that level right now, uh, is basically perks-based. It's the idea that you give for a gift back in exchange or you donate money. Uh, like I said, we do for-profit and non-profit, and if you're giving to a non-profit, uh, we've created the technology to allow your money to go directly into the nonprofit's checking account, so we don't even touch that money for one second, and you get a receipt saying your 501c3, you know, their 501c3, their tax ID number, and what your, do your donation was minus the retail value of anything you got back. 
Um, so it depends on what project. Like I said, you're getting something in exchange or you can just pledge money. Um, if it's a 501c3, you get the tax benefits. Um, but otherwise, at this moment, we're not doing any investment funding. Uh, and you know, we are obviously considering that route, but we also wanna see the direction it goes because we also feel like it's gonna come out and there's gonna be a lot of iterations of what happens after it comes out as people learn lessons on what's going on. So we're, we're just keeping an eye on it. taken place on Kickstarter and Indiegogo and community funded, there are actually um, relatively few examples like that, but when you hear about them, you're like, oh, you know, God, that's horrible. So. Yeah, um, and uh, um, Kickstarter just came out with um, updated rules that are intended to create some more accountability, and um, so they actually said that there's a legal requirement for their uh, fundraise, the people that are raising money on it, to follow through with the rewards that they've offered or whatever it is that they said they've done. Now, I don't know exactly what the recourse is, um, who would actually take them to court over that, but um, they are trying to be more accountable, but I think um, McCabe can probably answer yeah. this best. Yeah, this is obviously a question we get asked a lot because it is a new and innovative technology, and the, the answer I always give is the example of eBay. And when eBay first launched, you know, we, I don't know if you guys remember, but there was a lot of people were kind of scratching their heads at the fact of, oh, you know, I send you this money and then you're going to send me my stuff in the mail, you know, before e-commerce really took off. And, you know, there was a lot of people that got burned and there was a lot of people that lost their money. And eBay, you know, built an entire office complex just basically to handle all the customer, customer claims and people that were complaining about, um, you know, not getting the products and stuff like that. And they basically evolved to add the eBay rating and continue to uh, you know, make the concept more solid so that people would feel more confident in what they were doing. And I think that's what you're gonna see with crowdfunding. I think you know, we've already talked about the idea as this grows to add you know, a community rating to, to some degree into the, into the website for registered users and stuff. You know, the, the idea really comes down to, for us though, uh, one, educating the people that are giving money to, the, to, you know, to ask the right questions, to get to meet the person, to, you know, contact them, really get a feel for them, uh, but as well, um, you know, have, have the uh, understanding of what you're giving to. You know, if you just think it's a good cause because of the title, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's actually going there, and that's where it's important for us to have the filters we have, which is human review of all projects before we allow them to go launch and go live. Um, but you know, the reality is, uh, like Amy said, that the, the failure rate really is low when you look at you know, over $500 million in crowdfunding that's gone through uh, over the last five years uh, and in various forms and stuff, so. Did your questions get answered? Well, yeah. you know, again, how, 
will you foresee all nonprofits being able to move into this entrepreneurial road, you know, mode and, and profit making? I mean, at some level, aren't the businesses within PAC three fundraising to pay their cheap rent? Things like that. The the question is essentially how does entrepreneurship in the nonprofit world, how does it work? How do you actually get the accountability? How do you, uh, you know, develop essentially the mentality to make it a return on an investment? So, especially if there's public funds involved, you have some accountability. I think there's certain structures. Certainly, if you get a grant from a major foundation or something, there are a lot of criteria, audits required, other things like that that really can create a sense of uh, not only responsibility, but uh, ultimately liability if you fail to meet it. You literally can sign a contract at the time of the award or the investment, and that can determine the criteria, and it gives you a basis for both evaluating as well as uh, making sure that there is responsibility in the long run. In terms of how to finance some of the things like social services in particular, where you're dealing with um, you know, just an economic scale that is problematic. You're not likely to get a return on investment when you're giving or trying to support or give food stamps or whatever it happens to be, which is sort of a one-way track. And I think that is true. It's very difficult to do that. One of the models that occurs to me, however, that has been very successful, not so much in, in this country but in the third world, is microloans. Um, I mean, there are programs where what the experience has been is that if you give some of the folks who don't have the money, the skills, the opportunity, they respond and they can be very diligent and very effective in creating something. And, and it might even be on the level of somebody is in, a, you know, in their home and they've got a kid and they can't work. And if you give them the skills to do a daycare, daycare center um, or do childcare within their home, they can free up four or five other people to go be able to be in the workforce and they can get compensated for it. And so they're often opportunities and what I think we suffer from is the willingness to look at what those opportunities are and, and structure uh, deals or, or loans or whatever it is in a fashion that really works for those people. We have a tendency to say, this is the way we do it and if either you can do it our way or else you're not gonna get our money. And a lot of the problems need to think out of the box and have more flexibility to actually look at the situation that some of the people who need that kind of help are actually in and structure something that works for them. And there are a lot of examples of pretty high success when that is done compared to just trying to fit them into the, the existing patterns that may have a whole level of responsibility or, or criteria that they just don't understand how to deal with and that leads to failure. I'm a banker and I've worked with each type of you individuals before in your <laughs> industries and I understand them all and, and it's great. So when we're talking about, I like local vesting, if you have nonprofits who give money, they have a cause and mission and they've been vetted by the IRS. If you have a for-profit venture that just needs money and you give it and you don't expect anything in return but a gift or something, it's sort of a feel-good benefit. When you go into really investing in, say, local, you expect a return of your money. And so, usually in lending, you do underwriting to analyze a risk, and the likelihood that you're gonna get that money back. So in local investing, who, who's going to do that underwriting um, task? who does or who should be responsible so that at least if you go online and you're giving to some local thing in the valley, even though you live here, you know, where's that representation that that organization probably has a good chance of paying you back? Um, that's a really good question and um, I think there will be a whole kind of cottage industry that grows up around crowdfunding, like who's going to be the Moody's basically of, of the crowdfunding world. Because um, it's it's difficult at best and maybe unrealistic to expect individuals to vet all of these companies, um, and even if they're small, it's you know it's an, 
uh, it's a fairly big undertaking and it may be beyond um, the skills of some investors. So um, I think there'll be different ways that happens. Um, you know, the great thing about crowdfunding is you're using the wisdom of the crowd. There will be a lot of um, Q&As, which are all public and transparent on the site that I think all um, potential investors can benefit from. Um, and then you may see, you know, some kind of third party, you know, analysis or research or ratings companies kind of grow up around this as well. Um, do you want to sure. talk to this? We were talking about dreams earlier, so I guess I'll throw out an idea. Just, you know, it's kind of old school, I guess, but it's actually having a relationship with the people that you're investing in and knowing, you know, if you live, you're talking about local investing and investing in your own community, you know, it's, it's looking at, you know, if the person has just moved to this town and knows no one, you don't know them, and they have an idea that maybe it's not the best investment if you don't trust that. But as idealistic as it sounds, you know, I think that what I hope to see is really this uh, emergence of community again, where people do come together. And if you're investing in an idea, you're telling all your friends and neighbors to go support that idea because you're investing in that idea. And, uh, you know, really, like I said, it might be idealistic, but if we can have that come back to our communities, then I think you would see less businesses fail and more people supported and good ideas turn into reality. Um, sure. I couldn't have said that better, by the way. That was actually um, the right answer. And, um, <laughs> and, you know, the other thing is, as an investor, um, I mean, when crowdfunding is local or any of these uh, deals are local, you have a better sense of the market. Um, you may already be a customer of somewhere, and you know that they would really do well if they expanded into another location that you know, you know, is ripe for that sort of product or service. So, um, yeah, I think you can make the argument that it's actually um, less risky and there is more knowledge and information flow. And then um, the last point I would want to make on that is that my dream would be to see a fund um, so that individuals don't have to make all those decisions, but a local investing fund. Um, I would like to see a, you know, a Brooklyn artisanal food fund, you know, my area, and maybe, you know, you could have a Roaring Fork, uh, you know, Main Street fund or whatever it is. Um, those are harder to do, but maybe, you know, with the brain power here, someone can figure that one out. I'll give this to you. I just have one other comment. One of the things that Manaus does specifically in response to that kind of question is, at least with within our organization, we require that any project that we get committed to has a board member who's willing to take the time to actually be hands-on, feet on the ground, working with that entity. And it is the nature of the commitment that comes out of the members of the board, and we're actually talking about how to expand that just on a capacity basis because our board is not huge and, and there, there's some limits there, but at least in the last five years that approach has worked. And, and I think what you really want to do is create some expertise, some experience, and have it be right there. You, you can spend a lot of time talking conceptually, you can spend a lot of time putting together a plan and, and a vision and all of those kinds of things, but uh, when a plan hits reality, as we know, it it has a tendency to start changing and needing to morph pretty dramatically in many cases. And the way to respond to that is to have some experience and feet right there on the ground to be able to, to make those kinds of adjustments necessary to be successful. Um, I'm going to take her first. Yes? Me. Um, Lauren Bueller, and I'm the executive director to a youth cell, which is a private local nonprofit here. Um, so I think I'm representing a lot of nonprofits today, and it's inter an interesting conversation about how nonprofits can become entrepreneurs. Um, and I'd like your advice. We have a great panel of um, experts, and I, I see Rachel here. We have a lot of support from counties and cities up and down the valley, um, and Steve Beckley, of course. Um, so as you've shown, we work in the juvenile justice system, and we have started a project that hopefully will sustain our organization locally. And the project is selling what we do to other organizations, other communities, I should say, um, nationwide. Um, and so we're 
we're trying to step out into that entrepreneur um, region and think a little bit differently, and I would really like your advice on um, what, what do you think some of, we've done that, we've um, actually stepped into several communities and sold uh, what we do, so we've started just a little bit. <laughs> well, I think it's an interesting, it's a really interesting question, but what I have a tendency to say is look at who supports you and why they support you, and in many cases it's actually going to be the seed of an opportunity. I think one of the best examples that I can think of of a for-profit uh, venture that really supports a nonprofit here in the valley, and I see Lori here, but Carbondale Mountain Fair um, has been going for, what, 40 years or so at this point, and it was originally created as an opportunity to give the artists and the craftspeople the opportunity to, you know, put their wares out there, and, and it quickly became so successful that it became a for-profit entity, and it, I think, supports somewhere in the neighborhood of 70% of the Arts Council budget on an annual basis in Carbondale now. And, you know, if all of a sudden 40, you know, 70 percent of your expenses to operate annually as a nonprofit are, are generated in an entrepreneurial fashion, it completely changes what your organization is, is doing. A lot of nonprofits spend 80 percent of their time trying to raise money and 20 percent of the time doing the program. And when you reduce that load, you really increase the efficiency and success of the mission of the organization that was originally created. And so sometimes the key is to find compatible situations within you know what your mission is and what your programs are and look at in some way you know oftentimes there's an entrepreneurial opportunity it may not be exactly how you're funding it but there's a tangential thing that will actually work in a very compatible fashion and give you an opportunity to generate funds I mean Maybe it's a big brother kind of program and you get people who commit to that. I mean, I don't know exactly. I'd have to spend some time really having a better understanding of what kind of program you have. But I have found in our work that, um, you know, what, what you can do is you start off looking at what you do, how you do it, who supports you. And in many ways, that will lead you to, oh, wow, look at this over here. That could that's very much what we're doing. It's a different piece and it only comes in in this fashion, but you can generate 20 or 30% of your revenue if you get involved in a for-profit basis because a lot of people who support you like the idea of supporting for-profit entities that use their money for the right purpose and for a purpose that they can support. And it, give, it gives an opportunity for a rapid growth and, and, and a, it's a great marketing tool. And we've also found that in the nonprofit world when donors are approached and they know that their money is really being used efficiently and, and is in, sen in a sense multiplied because for every dollar that, that they give, now that nonprofit can generate 20 or 30 cents or 40 cents on that dollar and get a return on that and that means that they won't come back and ask you for another donation. Uh, it really leads to, you know, to solid support and it's, it's, a, it's a really good tool. So I'm sorry I can't be specific, but generically, that would be the kind of thing that I would suggest.